Let's open our Bibles to the 26th chapter of Matthew. If you would find Matthew chapter 26 and then find verse 36. Matthew 26 and verse 36. And if you didn't bring a Bible with you today, there's a Bible in the pew rack down to your left or your right. And if you'll take that Bible and find page 832, page 832, you'll find Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. And maybe you don't have a Bible, but you've got an iPad or some electronic device, and I hope that you'll find Scripture there as well. I trust that when I see you doing that, you're not texting or checking Facebook, but you are indeed uh, studying, reading along with me. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Before, Before we get there, though, let's pray. And there's just a word for you today from the Lord that I don't want you to miss. And so I want you to do two things. I want you to pray for me that I can deliver it in a way that you won't miss it. And then I want you to pray for yourself that you'll listen with a heart so that you won't miss it that way either. And so would you pray now for me and pray for yourself and I'll do the same. Let's let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for the fact that it's in a language we can read and understand. We thank you for the gift, Father, of that written word. Father, I pray this morning that I can just do justice to this text. Let us see all that went on in the heart and mind of our Lord and what he did, what he dealt with. I pray that it will be clear. And I pray that every person here, Father, will receive the word that you have for them today. How that specific word will relate to where they are and their circumstances this morning. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of years ago, a young man named Ricky Nelson sang a song about a garden party. It kind of sounded like this. Watch. Right now, and I've learned my lesson well, you can't please everybody, so you got to please yourself. How many of you remember old Ricky singing that? Look look at all you gray-headed old folks out there. That's a lot of years ago. I, too, want to take you to a garden this morning. A garden where old friends are gathered, but this is definitely not a party. In fact, the words, you can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. If those words had been on the forefront of Jesus' mind, our salvation, yours and mine, might not have ever been made possible. You can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. I'm sure thankful Jesus didn't believe that. I almost want to approach these verses on my knees. At the least, they call for our adoration. Charles Spurgeon preached from this same text in April of 1885. That's 130 years ago, and Brother Fred was in the audience taking notes that day, and... No, that, that is not in my notes. I don't know where that came from. Spurgeon preached from this text in April of 1885, and he concluded with these words. I am never more vexed within myself than when I have done my very best to extol his dear name. What is it but holding a candle to the sun I cannot speak as I would want of him. The blaze of this sun blinds me. Can I say amen to that? 
Even when I have done my best to study and to meditate on the Lord Jesus Christ found in these verses, I fear that my attempt to shed light on this truth will also be like holding a candle up to the sun. So it is with awe, with awe and it is with humility, and it is with reverence that I come to stand on this holy ground. Philip Bliss borrowed a description of Christ from Isaiah who predicted that the Messiah would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Philip Bliss wrote these words, Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Jesus knew sorrow and grief perhaps as no other man who had ever lived, but the sorrow and the grief that he experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane seemed to be the acclamation of all the sorrow he had ever known. This was indeed no garden party. Listen, we are indeed on holy ground. Matthew 26, verse 36 Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Now that's James and John. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible... Let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, Your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going Behold, the hand of the one who betrays me is here. Jesus' three years of earthly ministry are now completed. He had preached his last sermon. He had performed his last miracle. He had celebrated his last Passover with his disciples. But infinitely more important than that, he had come to be the last Passover lamb the perfect and only sacrifice for the sins of the world. Please understand that your salvation is at risk in Gethsemane. Please understand that your salvation is at risk in this garden. Jesus is not play acting. This is real spiritual warfare. The destiny of the souls of men and women hang in the balance. It's Thursday night, probably around midnight the last night of Jesus' life before his death. And he comes with the eleven. Judas has already left to go off and do his deed of betrayal. And so Jesus comes with the eleven to a place called Gethsemane. The word means olive press. Olive press. It is an enclosed garden or a small olive orchard. It was likely fenced or walled, and it had an entrance or a gate. And inside the garden, there was a press used to crush the oil out of olives. It probably belonged to a friend of Jesus. It's interesting for me to think of the nameless friends who rallied around Jesus in the last week before his crucifixion. You remember the owner of the donkey 
on which Jesus rode into Jerusalem for his triumphal entry. You remember the man who gave Jesus the upper room where he could share the Last Supper with his disciples. And now here is a friend who allowed Jesus to use his garden to pray. In fact, John's Gospel tells us that he came here often to pray. One scholar comments, those friends in the deserts of hatred... They were still oases of love. So Jesus and his disciples arrive at this garden and he tells eight of them, sit here. Probably at the gate or the entrance to the garden. And then he took Peter and the sons of Zebedee, as I said, that's James and John. He took them in a little further and notice in verse 38, he tells them to keep watch. The words have the idea of protect me from intrusion. The words have the idea of guard against interruption. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. With the words keep watch, Jesus goes into the garden even further. So I want you to get the picture here. There are eight of them at the gate. There are three of them inside And then there's Jesus who has even gone beyond that into the garden. And he falls on his face. He does not stand to pray. He does not kneel to pray. He falls prostrate on the ground and cries out, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. What's the cup? Whatever it is, it has Jesus grieved and distressed. Do you see that in verse 37? The words mean deeply troubled. The word means sorrowful. What's the cup? Whatever it is, it has Jesus overwhelmed. It has him distressed. The idea in verse 38 is that Jesus is surrounded by sorrow. He has been overcome with with distress. The agony of this temptation is unequaled. And Luke, the physician, tells us that the capillaries close to the surface of Jesus' forehead begin to dilate and burst under the deep distress and blood escaped through the pores of his skin and it begins to become mingled with his sweat and it falls down onto the ground. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus offered up prayers with loud cries and tears. So I want you to see Jesus on the ground On his face before the Father, I want you to see blood and sweat mixing on his forehead and tears coming down his cheeks. This this was no garden party. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. What's the cup? It's not Jesus dying. But understand, Jesus is praying, is there some other way, Father? Is there some other moral possibility? Is there some other spiritual possibility? If so, Dad, let's take that route. Now, did you catch that in verse 39? My Father. The word Father in the Greek is Abba. It is a word of intimacy. It is a word of close relationship. It's like our word daddy, papa. All throughout his ministry, Jesus addressed God as father. It drove the religious Jewish leaders crazy. They considered it blasphemy. Yes, God was the father in the sense of being the father of the nation of Israel, but God was not a father in the sense of his being a personal father to any individual. And yet that's the father, that's the kind of father Jesus came to reveal. And here Jesus does something that he never does anywhere else. He calls him my father. It intensifies the intimacy. 
which gives us a clue to the meaning of the cup. But, but first, notice two things. He comes and finds the disciples sleeping three times. Now, surely that disappointed Jesus. I think somehow, some way, Jesus needed to see them praying for him. Jesus needed to see them at least keeping watch. And yet they were sleeping at the moment of the greatest spiritual conflict in the history of the world. They were oblivious to the agony and the struggle that was going on with their Lord. Second, I want you to notice... How many times did the devil tempt Jesus in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry? Three. How many times does Jesus have to pray here before he rises to do the Father's will? How many times does Jesus pray intensely and earnestly before he goes, he rises and goes to do the will of the Father? Three. I believe the devil tempted him again. At this moment, three times, don't take the cup, Jesus. Don't drink the cup, Jesus. Don't do it that way. No. What's the cup? It's not his death on the cross. Jesus didn't fear that. How many times did Jesus predict during his earthly ministry that he would suffer and die? How many times did Jesus tell those disciples, the Son of Man must go up to Jerusalem and be killed and, su- and then on the third day rise again? He even said it at the beginning of this chapter. If you want to check out verse 2, the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. Physical terror held no death, excuse me, physical death held no terror for Jesus. He was not afraid to die. Here in this garden, Jesus knew that Judas was approaching. He knew Peter would deny him. He knew Pilate would sentence him. He knew the soldiers would crucify him. None of those things were causing the sorrow and the anguish and the grief and the distress that was pouring over his soul. So what's the cup? The cup was his becoming sin. The cup was Jesus becoming sin, absorbing the wrath of God. He saw the tidal wave of God's wrath coming. He saw the tidal wave of God's wrath, the Father's wrath, His Daddy's wrath. He saw the tidal wave of His Father's wrath coming upon His soul. The struggle in Gethsemane was not whether or not He would redeem man, but how He would redeem. And Jesus, who had committed no sin, Jesus, who had known not one sin, was to be made not sinful, was to be made sin for you and for me. Understand this. All of the sin from Eve in the garden to the end of time was poured into that cup. And Jesus had to drink it. All of your sin, all of my sin, all of everybody's sin poured into that cup and Jesus had to drink it. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
And on that cross, Jesus will cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's fury vented against all the sins of mankind. And Jesus takes it upon himself. And God the Father will turn his back on God the Son. And Jesus will die alone. My Father, if there is any other way, if it is possible... Let this cup pass from me. Daddy, is there another way for them to be saved than to have to be separated from you and alone? If there is, let's do it. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours, Dad. It was alone that Jesus prayed in dark Gethsemane. Alone he drained the bitter cup and suffered there for me. Alone, alone, he bore it all alone. He gave himself to save his own. He suffered, bled, and died alone. Jesus came to bear away in himself the sin of the world. He came to redeem men and women. He would not deviate from that purpose. He yields to the will of the Father, goes to the cross, drinks the cup, becoming sin for you, for me. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. In verse 44, Jesus prays a third time and the issue is settled. The hour is now at hand and Jesus rises from his prayer and he goes out to do battle. Look at verse 45. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise and let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I shall kiss is the one, sees him. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out and drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. How then shall the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen this way? At that time Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Judas arrives with a band of temple police and a number of Roman soldiers. They are carrying swords and clubs because they are ready for a fight. When Jesus had exposed Judas at the Last Supper, he hurried off to the chief priest who had hired him to help them arrest Jesus and it was the chief priest who brought these temple police. John tells us that a cohort of Roman soldiers was also present. A cohort is 600 Roman soldiers. There was probably less than that, but but the Roman soldiers were present because they did not want any disturbances. In verse 49, would you notice the greeting that Judas gave Jesus? Hail, Rabbi. That's it. It's not Lord, because that's all Jesus is to Judas. He's certainly not Lord, Rabbi. 
And having prearranged a signal, he kissed Jesus. Probably on the cheek. Maybe on the hand. It was the customary way for a student to greet his teacher. What an act of hypocrisy. Seeing Judas' kiss, the soldier sees Jesus, and Peter springs into action. Remember, Jesus had told him to watch (laughs) and to keep guard. And Peter springs into action. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us that it's Peter. John tells us that it's Peter. Matthew doesn't tell us that it's Peter. Because Matthew writes his gospel when Peter is still alive. And so he conceals his identity for fear of reprisal from the Jewish authorities. John writes, Peter's already died. So it doesn't make any difference. I'll tell you who it is. The guy that cut the man's ear off in the garden was Peter. John identifies him. Peter draws his sword and swings Because I said Jesus had told Peter to watch. Peter aims for the guy's head. The guy ducks and Peter slices off his ear. Peter didn't say, would you stand still there? I'd like to cut off your ear, sir. No. Peter draws that sword and he swings it and the guy ducks and Peter gets his ear. It is Peter the Magnificent. It is Peter the Pathetic. It is Peter the Magnificent because he comes to defend Jesus and what courage that took. It is Peter the Pathetic because Peter's courage soon disappears. In a few moments, he will turn and run. And besides, Jesus does not need Peter's pathetic help anyway. One prayer and 12 legions of angels are right there. That's 72,000 angels. Right there. Peter probably would have been killed on the spot right there by the Roman soldiers, except for the fact that Jesus rebuked him, and Dr. Luke tells us that he healed the servant's ear right on the spot. One last miracle of compassion. One last miracle that seems to say, I've come to bind up your wounds. One last miracle before he goes to fulfill his destiny as Savior of the world. Then those who had seized Jesus led him away. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Next Sunday morning, we will look at the crucifixion and gather around the Lord's table and remember. And then two weeks from today, we will shout that the tomb is empty. Let me me bring this to a close by giving you just two take-home truths today. In prayer, a person kneels before God so he can stand before man. In prayer, a person kneels before God so he can stand before man. That's that's what prayer is for. And we see this vividly illustrated in Jesus' life right here. What what did he do before he faced the battle in, in that garden? What did he do before he faced the struggle of Calvary? He prayed earnestly and he prayed intensely. You and I need to follow that example. In prayer, you enter heaven so you may face the battles of earth. Every day, you go out and face a struggle. Every day, you go out and face temptation. Every day, you go out and face a battle. My question for you is, are you prayed up? Have you spent time in prayer before you go into battle? The battle of your day, the struggle of your day, the the, the temptation of your day. In prayer, you kneel before God so you can stand before man. And then the second, the righteous one, Jesus, 
And this is the point of the whole morning. The righteous one, Jesus, becomes sin so that the sinful one, you, me, could be declared righteous. Let me say it again, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Friend, that is the essence of the gospel. The righteous one becomes sin so that the sinful one becomes righteous. Jesus became sin for you so that in Him you could become righteous in God's eyes. Can I put it bluntly? You deserve to go to hell, but Jesus intervened. You deserve to go to hell, but Jesus intervened. The righteous one became sin, so that the sinful one could be declared righteous. In January of 2000, leaders in Charlotte, North Carolina, invited their favorite son, Billy Graham, to a luncheon in his honor. Dr. Graham initially was hesitant to accept the invitation because he struggles with Parkinson's disease at that time. That's 15 years ago, and he was struggling with Parkinson's disease pretty good at that time. But the Charlotte leaders told Dr. Graham, we don't expect a major address. Just come and let us honor you. So he agreed. After wonderful things were said about him, Dr. Graham stepped to the podium and looked at the crowd and said these words. I am reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist who this month has been honored by Time magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his vest pocket. He couldn't find his ticket. So he reached in his trouser pockets. It wasn't there. So he looked in his briefcase, but he couldn't find it. Then he looked in the seat beside him. He still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle, punching the tickets. And as he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the great physicist down on his hands and knees, looking under the seat for his ticket. The conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. No problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, Young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. Having said that, Dr. Graham continued. See this suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My wife, my children, and my grandchildren are telling me I've gotten a little slovenly in my old age. I used to be more fashion conscious. They went out and bought a new suit for this luncheon and one more occasion. You know what that occasion is? This is the suit in which I'll be buried. But when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to immediately remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember. I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. Got a question for you, sir. Got a question for you, ma'am. I'm sure you know who you are. But do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're going? 
the righteous one, Jesus, became sin so that the sinful one, you, could be declared righteous. Jesus died for you. Will you believe that? You can know where you are going. Let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you today that Jesus did not turn away from the cup. That he did not yield to the temptation of the enemy and take another way. That he uttered those words, not my will, but your will be done, Father. How, 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 how do we thank him enough for drinking the cup? The cup of your wrath, the cup of your fury against sin, taking it for us so that we might become righteous. Be declared righteous. We, we, we say thank you, Father, by believing and then by serving. And I've got people in both camps in this room this morning, Father. I've got those who need to believe and I've got those who need to get serious about their service. I pray that during this invitation time you would speak to both groups and every response and every heart's decision would honor you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Friends, we're going to stand in just a moment and sing. If you would believe today that Jesus died for you, I want you to move out from where you are and come down an aisle and our staff will be here. You can know where you are going. You sure can. We want to tell you how. Maybe you've already made that decision and you would come to make it public today. Maybe you just need to come to this altar and pray. It's also the moment and the time that you can join our church. God's placed on your heart to be a member in this church. We'd, we'd welcome you here today. Welcome you as a part of our family. So let's quietly stand. And Fred's going to lead us in this hymn of decision. And It's a time, I, I, I would say, almost as sacred as, as those moments in the garden. Because really the souls of men and women hang in the balance every time we stand and sing an invitation hymn.